hoping for that upstream motion You could be a sockeye dying in a creek Back to the land in a couple of weeks You could be a cedar It's late October and an amazing thing is happening right now. The salmon, they're back. Day after day we watch them arrive, filling our rivers, coming in from their hidden world at sea just like they do every autumn here on the coast of BC. We wait for them all year, and then as the winter rains arrive, so do they. So who are these salmon? They're chum salmon, one of five different Pacific salmon species on our northwest coast. There is the prize-fighting coho salmon, the giant chinook salmon, the lake-loving sockeye salmon, and the abundant pink salmon. But it's chum salmon that are the familiar salmon to so many of us. We know them well. If you're watching salmon spawn in a neighborhood stream or river along the coast, it's likely that they're chum salmon. And so, on this late October day, as they have done for thousands of years, the salmon are back. They have just swum into the river from the ocean, smelling their way along, looking for the scent of the stream that they were born in four years ago. So who's who among these spawning chum salmon? Female chum salmon are slender, with distinct dark bands along their side. Males, on the other hand, are bigger, with hooked noses, large dog-like teeth, and irregular vertical stripes, like dripped paint. The female returns from the ocean to lay her eggs in stream bed gravel. Once a female senses a gravel of the right size, with flowing water rich in oxygen that's just right for her eggs, she begins to dig a nest. She does this by rolling sideways and sweeping her tail with vigorous thrusts. Time and time again she sweeps, then circles back to hover over the nest. Meanwhile, males fight to be beside the female, hoping to fertilize her eggs. And the biting and butting between males is rough and hard-hitting. With her nest dug in the gravel, or her red as it's called, the female moves in to drop her eggs. Sensing that this is the moment, several males follow her in and spray clouds of their sperm, or milt, that fertilize her eggs. This all happens so quickly, we really need to see it in slow motion, to see the female release her pink eggs, and the males let go their milky cloud of sperm on her eggs. The female then continues on to dig another nest in the upstream direction, spreading gravel across the just laid eggs. All in all, a female chum salmon will lay close to 3,000 eggs, Many of the eggs are now out of sight and buried within the stream bed, sitting in spaces between the gravel. Some eggs are swept away by the current, supplying critical food for the many fish and birds drawn to the spawning bed feast. The energetic dipper is adept at finding loose eggs lying on the stream bed. And so too are the gulls. And then winter comes. As the winter months pass, clear stream water flows down through the gravel, bringing oxygen to the developing eggs. But there are hazards. Winter rainstorms can create floods that erode stream bed gravel, scattering the eggs into the floodwaters. And many human activities near rivers create muddy waters that can fill the spaces in gravel, preventing oxygen from reaching the eggs and causing them to suffocate. But if all goes well, by February, tiny salmon have grown, their eyes visible inside the egg. And then, movement. Growing stronger, the tiny salmon finally breaks through the soft shell of the egg. And then, it's free. But the baby fish, called alevin, remain attached to the nutrient-rich yolk of their egg, upon which they feed. 
For the next month or so, the alevin, about two to three centimeters long, stay safely within the spaces in the gravel, hidden from predators in the stream above. The yolk sac makes the alevin awkward and slow moving, but as they grow, the size of the yolk sac shrinks, allowing them to move about within the gravel. Once the yolk sac is largely gone, the young salmon emerge from the gravel to look for food, hunting under the cover of night for bits of organic debris that float in the stream. They rise to the surface and gulp air to fill their swim bladders, giving them the buoyancy to swim freely in the stream. By later in March, the tiny salmon are darting about in the stream, feeding on algae, tiny animal plankton and insects, and are called fry. The fry of most Pacific salmon species develop dark bars on their skin to help them blend into the shadows so that it's harder for predators to see them, such as the swift trout, the energetic mink, and the patiently stalking merganser. So the salmon fry are wary, hiding in the shadows of logs and overhanging branches. The tiny salmon thrive in clear water streams with plenty of places to hide and shaded by overhanging trees and bushes that keep the stream water cool and that are home to insects that fall into the waters below. By May or June, the salmon fry have grown to a length of four to five centimeters and for many salmon species, the fry are ready to head to sea. They swim downstream to where the freshwater river meets the saltwater ocean and the rich marshes of the estuary. Here they can hide among the grass-like plants while fattening up on the rich supply of insects and invertebrates. But here too there are predators, such as the patiently stalking heron, the kingfisher that swoops down from above, and the fast swimming cormorant. The estuary is a mixing zone of ocean and river and an ideal place for the young freshwater bred salmon to adapt to salt water. As this happens, the fry's bars transform to silver, a better camouflage color for the open ocean. These juvenile, ocean-going salmon are called smolts. This begins their ocean journey, which for chum salmon is four years, but for other species of salmon can be two to five years, at first in coastal waters and then out to the open Pacific Ocean. At sea, where salmon live most of their lives, they are bright and silver-scaled adults. Out here in the ocean, they feed on schools of smaller fish, such as herring, and abundant animal plankton, such as the tiny shrimp-like krill. After years at sea, and grown large on the rich feed in the ocean, the salmon answer a mysterious urge to return to the BC coast. And they begin their long swim home. As they arrive at the coast and swim south, in search of their home stream, adult salmon face new challenges. Large fleets of commercial fishing boats are poised to intercept them. So too are thousands of sport fishers all along the coast. Marine mammals are ready for them too, such as the salmon-eating resident killer whales that depend heavily on this annual feast of returning salmon and sea lions also congregate along the salmon's route, feeding heavily. And closer to the river mouths, seals are standing by. Following the scent in the ocean, by early fall the salmon find their way back to the mouth of their home river. Once in the river, all salmon bodies change and they're called spawners. Chump spawners change into patterns of green, gray, and purple. Salmon work their way up the current, following the scent of their home stream. Finally, they reach their spawning beds. Here, the female digs her nest in the gravels, and males fight for the chance to fertilize her eggs as she lays them. As the eggs are laid, the circle of life is complete. From egg to alevin, to fry, to smolt, to adult, to spawner, and now to egg again. 
the salmon's circle of life is complete. Of the female's thousands of eggs, only about two will make it back to spawn, but that's enough to keep the circle of life flowing. However, their story is not over. Salmon use the reserves of stored energy gained at sea to feed the work of nest building and mating. Once in the streams, they don't eat, and quickly they grow weaker. Here too on the spawning beds, salmon have predators. There are bears looking for fresh salmon to eat, to fatten up for their long winter hibernations to come. And there are energetic otters on the hunt. The spawning salmon provide a great wealth of feeding for many in the preparation for the long, lean winter to come. It is bittersweet that the salmon come home to create life and then so quickly die. Within a week or two of spawning, their energy spent, both male and female are dead. But their dying in turn feeds other life. Eagles gather along streams to feed on the dead salmon. Scavengers are everywhere. The nutrients contained in each salmon are gained far and wide in the Pacific Ocean. When salmon return home and die, these nutrients are released, fertilizing our streams. And when bear and otter carry the salmon into the nearby trees, the nutrients are carried there too, fertilizing forest life. And other small animals and insects and birds come to dine on these forest salmon and the nutrients are spread out further and further. Our forests are truly salmon forests, where trees and plants and the entire forest web of life are enriched with ocean nutrients delivered by the salmon. So the salmon live on, and these nutrients feed algae and bugs in the stream and forest that will be there to feed the young salmon fry when they rise from the stream gravels next spring. And so it is that the salmon's circle of life continues on. Around and around and around. You could be a salmon swimming in the ocean. You could be living for that upstream motion. You could be a sockeye dying in a creek. Back to the land in a couple of weeks. You could be a cedar growing on the shoreline every year salmon like an ancient timeline eating from the soil drinking up the rain standing through the seasons time and again